So uh, my name is Jen Toxic. I'm coming into Google Hangout from the Larder, and I'm joined today by the lovely Teresa Howard, who is uh, a writer and a uh, member of the board of Mercury Musical Developments. Uh, say hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for doing this very unexpected <laughs> vacation <laughs> chat with me. I really appreciate it. Um, we're also on Twitter at another nibble. If anybody wants to ask us a question, you're more than welcome to come and join in. Um, we'd love to have you with us, and this will be up on YouTube afterwards if you can't make it right now. <laughs> so, uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, being a woman and writing musicals, because uh, we're both members of Women Who Write Musicals, and there's how many of us now? 200 and... Yeah, it's not far off 300, I think. Not it's... far, is it? I'm just no. looking it up. No, it's not. It's amazing. Um, international as well. 288 we are now. That's amazing. It's incredible, isn't it? So uh, let me just say a little bit about how that started. Um, Mark Shenton, the lovely Mark Shenton, posted a, a blog uh, about the paucity of women uh, writing musicals. And uh, Victoria Saxton piped up, uh, the lovely executive director of Mercury, piped up on Facebook and said, what's that all about? Let's do something. And I opened a Facebook group and thought, I'll see how many of us there are and figured that there might be a few dozen of us. You know, I could name probably like 25 of us. And uh, suddenly there's 288 of us from around the world. And counting. I mean, it grows quite quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, it's amazing, really. Um, and you're the person, thank you so much for doing this, who uh, who lets people in, who who goes and speaks I'm, to people. I'm St. In... Patricia. So, well, <laughs> Teresa on the gate. Uh, so how... <laughs> Well, have you been able to say had lovely chats with people and say hello? Yeah, I, um, yes, I have had chats with people, and some people who haven't been able to join because they haven't quite fulfilled, you know, they haven't written anything yet, and but are doing other things for um, uh, women who write musicals. Uh, so I've been able to say to them, "Well, do let us know about what else you're doing and yeah. how you're promoting, and we'll put that up on our website." Or we'll, we'll right. um, so it's great. That's really good. Um, and it, we have very simple criteria, really, I think. We decided that you have to be a woman who writes musicals in order to join women who write musicals. That's it, isn't it? I think that's yeah, our Some people, some men have wanted to join, and um, some women who've n never written a musical have wanted to join. But I, I just, when people have said that, well, I've just said, well, when you um, have written your musical, come back to us. <laughs> I mean, we don't ask for it to be produced, or it, you know, any, if yeah. you write a musical, you could join. <laughs> that's that's kind of it, really. Yeah. Um, which I think is great. But we, uh, so what that means is we have a plethora of writers because we also have some writers who've had stuff on Broadway and in the West End, and we have people who have just written their first show. So yeah. I, for me, that's a really lovely community. No, it's fantastic. Um, and our first London event uh, is coming up. So we're doing a thing called Tiny Shows. Yeah. Um, Tiny Shows is a project I've wanted to do for ages where we all gather, uh, well, I say we all, not 288 of us, but 30 writers and composers. And I 30 how many of us there are. I don't I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, it's 30. And what's wonderful is um, I put out an invitation uh, to people to, well, let me explain what it is first. It's 30 writers and 30 performers and a few stage management and a couple of directors in a building. Uh, so we're working with So-and-So Arts, which is run by the lovely Sarah Berger. And they have a great building that they're working in at the moment in the city. And we're going to go and join them for a weekend. Uh, and our performers are coming from uh, the Musical Theatre Academy, a lot of them. So lovely Anne-Marie has put the word out to her ambassadors who are going to come and join us. Um, and we're going to meet on Saturday morning, and we're going to be told what the uh, story is that we're telling for the weekend, which I have yet to reveal to anyone. But let's say it's The Wizard of Oz. It's not, but let's say it is. Um, and then we're going to write tiny shows for tiny moments from that story throughout the weekend, so that by the end of the weekend, we can flood the whole building with lots of mini, mini musicals and tell the whole narrative from beginning to end in tiny little beats, um, which I'm really excited about. And the whole project is about taking risks in writing. It's about writing fast and furiously, about working with people you might never normally work with and trying stuff out you would never normally 
get the chance to try out. It's about writers composing and composers writing and performers writing and uh, all that stuff. Um, and we are lucky enough to have Arts Council funding for it, uh, about which I'm thrilled because I wanted to do an event where I'm kind, I'm kind of frustrated with a lot of the events for writers uh, are, a lot of the opportunities offered to writers are competitive. And I wanted to do something that was non-competitive. So we put out the invitation to the Women Who Write Musicals group and everyone who said yes is involved. There's no, there was no audition. Uh, and then we had a few spare places, so we invited Mercury writers to come and join. Uh, and yeah, so we've got a couple of guys in there who I hope won't yeah, feel. I'm really glad we have some guys too. It's good. Yeah, we do. Yeah, in fact, uh, don't we have a collaborator of yours coming along? Isn't someone? I well, I don't know whether he's coming or not yet. <laughs> I I hope I, yes, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. But we do. We certainly have a couple of you know guys in the mix there. Yeah. Uh, and what's exciting for me about that is we really do get to do the stuff that you don't normally get the chance to do because normally in a competitive opportunity you might pitch your material and then you, you know, three people, five people can benefit from a yes but however many other people get rejected again and I just wanted to do something where we said yes to everybody. Um, so that's been really great and we get to do things that are crazy and foolish. <laughs> um, and that's really exciting for me. Um, so you're coming to join us, are you, in that? Yes. I'm yes, totally I'm going to be part of that. I'm really excited about it. It, it, me, it reminds me of when I was very young and, um, and I did a 48-hour improvisation. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We worked all through the night, so we, we just acted. This was just acting, this wasn't writing, but in effect it was still writing because we were still yeah. in the theatre. We had an audience and um, we were allowed off at small moments to go to the loo and to have food. <laughs> all the rest of the time we just performed improvisation and tiny sketches and tiny shows. So it kind of reminds me of that, but in a slightly different way. And what, what are the things that that, what demands does that kind of stuff make on you? It's it's very thrilling and it's also very exhausting. Um, it makes you create things that you didn't know you could create, and I think that's the other thing. You, it it's almost like sort of psychological writing because you don't know what you can do until you're put on the spot in a moment like that, where you just things come out that you didn't know you could do. And how does that? feel for you as an artist? What does that do for you as an artist to make those discoveries about yourself? Uh, it's quite exciting, but I, I think going into the process is quite terrifying, but it is, <laughs> it's, it is, yeah. um, because mostly what everything I do, most of what I do is very um, alone, it's very on my own, and so to suddenly uh, be working with people that I've never met before, and I mostly only work with people I know, um, and so to work with people who you've never met before, it just reminds me of that, of improvising. Just yeah, like... one of the things I love about the Tiny Shows project, if, and hopefully it will work this way, is we're not just saying everybody write their own version of this story. We're saying we're breaking the major story down into tiny pieces and we're saying pick the pieces that inspire you but we also have to all work together to make sure that the whole story gets told fairly and equally so it's not just about squirreling away in a corner and writing with your collaborator it's about working with lots of different people and as a whole collective making sure that what we are responsible for for the audience is you know just for the audience to have a good time and see the whole story yeah uh, so I hope it's community binding in that way. Was it when you did the 48 hours, presumably? Yes, it was. And, and it also reminds me of the devised theatre that I did also in the past, because that was very much that same sort of thing where we were writing things and I would say, oh, well, I want to write a song here. <laughs> you know, and this guy would say, oh, yeah, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll write, I'll compose the music for it. And this would just happen in a very ordinary way. We weren't. It reminds me of that a bit as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Of the do, do you think that um, it will be a bit frantic? I don't, I've got no idea. I think it's kind of best to go in just... With no expectations? Yes, I think so. Because um, you just don't know. 
we had planned to do, and I and still will do, I think, some provocations in the week leading up to it. So my thought was that in instead of doing, instead of going at it thinking, well, I'm going to write a three-minute musical, or I'm just going to write one song because that's three minutes long. Mm -hmm. um, my thought was that we could think about things like how how does song feature in short storytelling in a different way to how it features in big storytelling, um, and what is short storytelling? You know, what is short form story? How does that manifest itself? Um, I was hoping actually uh, that, and I I might still try and do this that um, the lovely Joanne Harris would join us because she's been she does story time on Twitter. And she tells stories in tweets, which I think is just, and they are beautiful little tiny gems of story. Like, or, yeah. Oh, wonderful. I thought she might come and hopefully she'll come and talk to us about that at some point. Um, but I'm very interested in not only that, but also what makes a dramatic moment. Because I think we're so used as writers to talking about three beat journeys and the, the journey from one mo moment to another but I'm very interested in what makes a little tiny gem of a moment um, and that it doesn't have to have any journeys in it, that it doesn't have to have anything other than the, to capture you for a second uh, mm -hmm. and then release you like a, I don't know, what is like, like a, I don't know, catch a release thing, what is that? <laughs> what is you know that I mean? moment where you're lost in something and yeah. where you relate to it and then the voice that they're speaking is who feels like your voice and yeah. it's like listening to a really good song, well, but that's musical theatre, you know, or <laughs> the pop song, you know, a, a really good song. I, I, the other day at the hospital club, I was listening to this, he was 20, I think, a really, really young guitarist, and his songs told the most amazingly brilliant stories. Wow. Um, his name was Luke, uh, I can't remember his surname, uh, but he was he was really good, and he, he just told really good stories, and my daughter and I were completely wrapped. But it wasn't just what he told, it was also how he told it. So That's craft, isn't it? I think there's a lot of craft. Like, for example, I think money notes, you know, when you, when you have that big high note and you can hear the singer building up to it and the structure of the song is leading up to it and everything that hits at that high note moment, mm. for me, that's that, that capture moment of drama that even if you don't know the song and you've come into it just before that high note, you can hear that ramp, can't you? And you know it's coming. So I think that kind of thing is really important. And what's lovely about that is it will it will allow us to consider little tiny individual moments of craft, of the craft of making, you know, drama with song. Um, and that's really exciting. So I hope we can discover some of those things in the lead up to it so that by the time we get there, we have some idea of things we might like to experiment with or... So it won't be just, you know, we're not just tumbling out onto the stage so we will have some preparation time. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I so, yeah, even just to think, oh, I'd like to write a two-second song or whatever, you know. Okay. Just in that way, I think it'd be yeah. interesting. Um, so that's Tiny Shows. Um, we will be putting up more information about that on Twitter, so anybody who would like to come and engage, we will have an invited audience uh, on the Sunday, so people will be able to come along and have a look. Um, and there are still a few places for performers as well, so if anybody is really interested and feels like, scary, improvised, quick learning thing is their thing, then they should get in touch. Um, on Twitter, we're at Another Nibble. Uh, let's just talk a little bit more, if we can, about women and women writers and being a woman writing, because it, the more... The more I want there to just be equality, the more I realize that there are so many areas in which that there are challenges for women that there aren't for men. Um, so very recently, uh, and I, places I would like there to be equality. So it's often with women, it's often childcare. And we were talking earlier about Lynn Gardner um, posted a, an article in The Guardian about childcare and the world of theatre and how it doesn't quite make provision for those things yet. Um, and, and for me, that is a very, it's a problem that really affects women and should affect both genders. But because women predominantly tend to be the primary caretaker in this country, um, which I don't think is true everywhere. I think Scandinavia, there's a lot more equality in that sense. But in this country, certainly, uh, I've had uh, women come to me and say, "I, you know, I have childcare issues, that, and I would like to work with them, so I make provision for those things." But mm -hmm. I don't have children, and you, so tell me, tell me about that. <laughs> um, 
I don't know. Yes, it is very. I think it is difficult, and I think some, but some women manage manage it very much easier than others. And I think it, it's not just the children; it's also on the partner that you have. And um, I think it. Yeah, I think it was very difficult. And certainly with writing a play, I did other kinds of writing when my children were really small because the the kind of breadth of creating a whole world of a play I found really difficult um, in, in terms of little bits I need you when you're working on a show you've got to be able to sit down when you're doing the rewrites and just do go through the whole thing well there yeah, was yeah. never enough time to do that and um, and also it's partly who you are I, I was much too uh, much of a hands-on mother to be able to take the time away even if I was given it. I wanted to be there with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I did weird things like I had to still be making theatre so I wrote puppet shows. <laughs> and I bought this amazing Punch and Judy theatre from a Punch and Judy man and wrote puppet shows for them. So it was just a way of continuing to write shows. <laughs> So you wrote tiny shows. It's basically I wrote what you're tiny saying. shows for them yes. <laughs> <laughs> to make them laugh. And That's fantastic. Um, well, it was just a way of carrying on. But I, because I to write a whole actual theatre play again um, was quite difficult until they got old enough to be able to have that space of time. Yeah. For me, it's been, um, it's been uh, you know, actors. A lot of my friends, and I try and only work with friends. <laughs> I try and work with, make friends with the people I'm working with, and work with. I, I'm very tribal like that. Um, and I, and I appreciate everything, every aspect of every person I work with. So women who are mothers, it's, it's part of them, and it's part of, you know, I want all of them to be in the room. I embrace all of that. Um, so for me, the the issue has been not necessarily that brain focused thing, but rather the physical present, having them physically present in the room, and therefore saying, "Bring the child." Actually, I was reminded by one of my friends, Annaline Beachy, came to play Emma Hamilton for me on HMS Victory once, and had just had a little girl, Rose, beautiful little baby, uh, and her husband, Simon Grief, who also works in theatre. Uh, they all came to Victory because I said to the Navy, <laughs> because it is a commissioned warship, I said. I'm afraid I need a quiet private space for a family. <laughs> uh, and one of the naval officers said, "Oh, they can have my cabin." Oh. So that he, because they have their offices are on board in cabins. So they they happily had a cabin on HMS Victory, oh. um, which was wonderful and actually really easy to organise. You just we just asked, and they said yes. Um, amazing. Yeah, it's really wonderful, and it was a lovely experience for them as well because they were, and for us because the family was there and the baby, and you know, I love all that. Um, yes, so I, for me, that was it's that physical presence, but I've also found challenging, and uh, some of the actors that I've worked with have found challenging that when you bring the baby into the room, your brain, but you're torn between your work brain space and your parenting brain space. Um, and I, I don't think we've quite nailed how to make that work yet. And obviously there are options. You can have a separate room. You could have a crash with somebody, you know, somebody that the parents trust to do the childcare. And then your child is just around the corner, but you're in the room working and you can go. I think that's the best solution that I know right now for, yeah. if, for if the actor feels that they're torn between the two. But honestly, I've had audition days where we just put a blanket on the floor in the room and baby was in the room with us and mum and dad were in the room with us and then we had people come in and sort of do a workshop with us and then I was like and this is the baby <laughs> and you know that just that with a two year old you just couldn't because they'd be well, running we, we did <laughs> I can't imagine it That's what we did although my auditions aren't really auditions they're more um come and meet us, have an improv play, play with some Lego, play with some play. There's always toys. We have Play-Doh in my room a lot. <laughs> um, so actually, the two-year-olds fit right in, really. <laughs> mm. But I guess if you're working in a very traditional way, that's, le that's more of an issue, I would think. Um, well, I think one thing it does teach you, which is a good thing, and that was it taught me amazing discipline, having the children, because... I knew I only had a certain amount of time 
to work before I had to go and collect them from school or yeah. um, when I was doing research at the British Library, I used to just get on the train, go and do this amount of work. I had that amount of time and then I knew I had to go back. I, yeah. You didn't have the luxury of being able to start and stop whenever you wanted, but you, it taught me to be very disciplined, actually, um, and in some ways quite a good uh, discipline, really. Yeah, no, I understand that. I think regulating your time when you're a freelancer and, you know, I have days when I can sit at my desk and get loads of stuff done and I'm like a train tra travelling down the tracks really fast. And then other days I just um, browse the internet a lot and make tea. <laughs> and yeah. Don't do quite so much work. So I get that when you only have half an hour to... You uh, know, really focused. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely helps with that, I think. I get that. I really get that. Well, do you think, and I'm not really one to, um, I'm not really fully informed on the facts and figures of this, but do you think there are other things that affect women writers, and especially women writers of musicals maybe, um, in terms of how much opportunity there is for the development of work? And I, I'm going to now badly quote some statistics that Nicholas Heitner never once directed a play by a woman when he was at the National, is that that's true. very shocking. Yes, I read that. Um, I don't know whether that's true, but it's quite possibly true. Uh, Have you ever experienced a moment where you've gone, oh, hang on, this person is talking to my composer who's a man and not to me? Have you ever had any of those things? I, the thing is, I ha once I know that it's unusual. It, I know that it's unusual for women to be, it's not just musical theatre writers, it's also playwriting. There just are less of us. I, it does feel like that. But when I've actually been there in the room working with someone, I've never actually felt, I've never felt that I was discriminated against. You know, I haven't either. And it's really hard, I think, that because it would be different if I could say, oh, well, so-and-so said this to me or so-and-so told me I didn't get that job because I'm female. But it's so difficult to pinpoint those moments where you can say, look, this, or, you know, listen, this is what was said. So it's really hard to know how to fight that fight in many ways I think because I just don't know where you know it's it's either invisible or it's too big or it's big statistics well, I'm not sure what we can do to to really make a difference to that stuff actively I don't know I mean I do think it perhaps is not a coincidence that three projects that I've worked on all the producers have been women that uh, it. so that's telling me something yeah, it tells me that maybe things in the past might have been done if I'd found the right people to do them. And, yeah. um, it feels a bit strange and shocking that they are, um, but it does doesn't seem to be a coincidence. Really. No, I think you're right. I mean, I there certainly is. You know, it's it's true. It's just knowing how to proactively do something about it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also the issue of not enough parts for women to play, um, which I think we can do something about. And I think that is true. And, I, you know, to just look at all the parts you've written in a play and go, I'm just going to make that one a woman and that one a woman, and just even to just randomly do that and to, to, to make choices to tell women's stories and f stories from a woman's point of view, I think are choices that we can certainly make. Yeah, I think that is true. And... Recently, um, at the MMD conference, there was a lot of talk about, at drama school, there's so many girls wanting to go into musical theatre, and it just occurred to me that wouldn't it be interesting to try and inspire some of those girls who are only a small amount of them are ever going to actually get to be stars in musical theatre, to, uh, to write some of the shows instead. Well, yes, to make their own work. I'm a big fan of that. I think... Um... You know, and I'm a big fan of writers producing their own work as well, as you know. I think anyone who just wants to make it should just make it. I, you know, I think if you have if you have work in you, then just make it. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of of actors getting together in collectives and working and supporting each other and and putting stuff out there. Um, and I think that will make a huge difference because you're right. It's kind of weird, isn't it? There's there always seems to be more girls when I work for people like YMT UK. Um, there's, they do a show every year that is specifically all female because they have always got more female actors than male. 
Um, and that, and it, it's but even in. Well, I remember the, the old good old days when I was doing a lot of um, community theatre. That was also true that we would we always had the guys were guaranteed a good part because yes. there weren't as many of them. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and yet so many parts, good parts, are written for men. So they are, and at drama school, quite a lot of because my youngest daughter's at Central, and quite a lot of the time at drama school, they have to give. Girls, they have to divide up the good roles um, between part sharing and things. Yeah, yes, they have to do sharing so that everyone gets to have a go at some of the really good parts. And yeah, and also, you know, a lot of that is because there aren't enough good parts in any show for women. Mm -hmm. um, I may can think of some notable exceptions, Gypsy being one of them, but that you know, it's often the case. I think so. Yeah, there's there's stuff we can do proactively about that and to self-produce and to encourage other writers to do producing. Speaking of encouraging other writers, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about MMD? Um, yes, I could talk a little bit. Um, do you want to tell us what it is for those of us who are watching and are not familiar with it. Uh, MMD is a I suppose you'd call it an association of um, musical theatre writers um, from people who've only just begun to people who've been in musical theatre for a long time. Um, it's a place also for nurturing new writers, um, giving them opportunities to do things. Um, it's developing all the time. It's It's got a, an arts council portfolio and is connected to musical theatre network. Uh, the the executive um, producer of it at the moment is um, Victoria Saxon, who's just taken over. But it Yay! Yes, she's wonderful. <laughs> um, but it was Neil Marcus before that, and then we had a, quite a gap when there wasn't anybody, but we've been carrying on regardless. Um, there are lots of exciting events, and it's always growing, and I think it's going to grow quite a lot more with Victoria now. Um, we should say to people that they can find out more at www.mercurymusicals.com. Yes, exactly. Um, but but tell me some of uh, some of the events and some of the stuff that Mercury organises. Just give us some some examples yeah, of that. Yeah, we um, we every year we have a connected event, which is a conference with um, Musical Theatre Network, where we're talking generally about musical theatre. Um, we've also uh, doing. A new event which is going to be biannually, uh, bi no, every two years, is that right? I think that's biannual, yeah. Um, and uh, where it's going to be a showcase for new writers' work. Um, and um, there are going to be people are going to be able to pitch for their work rather than sending stuff in. They can send them in if they want, but they're also, there are going to be places so they're going to be able to pitch their work at regional theatres and. This is really a showcase that we're trying to, um, it's sort of going on the, the, the way that it's based on the ideas of the, the NAMT uh, showcase in America. Where so that's trying to national, the National Alliance of Musical Theatre. That's it. Uh, where we're trying to connect uh, new writing with regional theatre as well as independent producers. Um, at the moment, there are some really good regional theatres that are putting on new work, but it's really just trying to connect up new yeah. work with regional theatre. And well, we say that um, the Curve in Leicester does a lot of uh, new musical theatre and is very supportive. Um, I know that Chichester, although I just read that Jonathan Church is leaving yes. Chichester, but I know that he's transferring shows to the West End and does a lot of you know musical theatre. Uh, supporting Yorkshire Playhouse. Um, oh, there's lots. There are quite a lot. I mean, it is growing all the time, actually, and which is magnificent because we went through a very dark, cold period of yeah. regional theatres stopping producing and just becoming receiving houses and having no funding. And I think having no funding is probably still true, but we, we're ploughing on regardless. Yes, I think that's right. And the the the, the Arts Council funding um, MMD is helping to make that happen really. Uh, I think Victoria would be a much better person to talk about this than me, but anyway. Um, but it's called, we've called it BEAM, um, B-E-A-M, which is like shining a spotlight on new work really. Okay. Called it BEAM, and it's starting in 2016. 
I was going to say, wait, so pe there's going to be information about that on the website, right, for people to on engage the with. The and, and there's also lots of other exciting things like the Stiles and Drew Award, um, which is part of the Sondheim um, New Performer of the Year Award. Um, there are lots of other things like that and residences and some new possibilities coming up as well, which um, would be good. And also, I know that Mercury has just started a buddy system for writers, which is really important. A really lovely idea where you can have someone to be your buddy to sort of so that you have a mentor. Uh, in a way, I suppose if you have an agent, it's they're your buddy. But most writers, when they're starting out, don't have that buddy. And um, most writers who've been going for twenty years don't have that buddy. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but this would be a way of of having that buddy, so that you could have someone to talk to and about your work, and someone about applying for grants and what to do when you just don't know which way to turn, really, and That's just someone great. to talk to about. That's great. That's really good. It, it, it is, in fact, why I started the Larder, because I want. I felt like there was a lots of people out there who didn't have knowledge and information that yeah. some of us had because we'd got experience. And so I started the Larder to say, here I am. I have some information. If you need it, give me a shout. So it, the buddy system is fantastic. I think anything that connects us up as a community, here's what I feel about the competitive thing. And I know you and I have talked about this. Um, I feel that there was a period of time where all of the opportunities available to new writing, new musical theatre writing in this country was competitive. And what that does is it puts us in competition with one another. No matter how much we say and feel that we support other writers, there is a sense that I can't talk about my work because you might take my idea. And I can't, you know, so therefore we miss out on peer to peer critique of our work and that kind of thing. And also a sense that. I can't tell you what I'm submitting or I'm up against the same people all the time for competitions and and I think anything that re glues us as a community is a really brilliant thing so I think the buddy system is is fantastic as a new idea and and really indicative as well I think of Victoria's uh, <coughs> style of leadership for, for Mercury you know really in that in that great community supportive way that I'm really excited about well because she she is a writer and she studied in New York as well she studied musical theater so she is talking you know she's trying to work from the inside out yeah. and I think that does she knows what's missing and so I think she does really she is really trying to invent new ways to nurture writers and I think that's what yeah. we really need yeah absolutely absolutely um, so uh, the board of Mercury is full of magnificent people. Can we can we talk about that? Are we allowed? <laughs> um, yes. Well, I, I'm sure I'm bound to forget somebody. Or <laughs> um, yes, give us a few examples. I'm not I'm not going to press you for all the names, but give us a few examples. Um, uh, Sean Gray, who um, is uh, Weinberg from Weinbergers. Um, so Joseph Joseph Weinberg is one of the biggest publishers of musical theatre in the world. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, John Cohen, who is a media, amazing media lawyer. He is fantastic, and he is so supportive of of writers and new writing. He, if if I have an agent in the world, it's John. <laughs> um, there's John Sparks, who is we don't see very often, but he's in he works in America with. Um, I can't remember what the name of uh, A N M T. They're called, although they're That's not called right. that anymore. They're called something new now. But um, they're based in L A. And he used to be at uh, in Chicago, and now yes, is in right. L A. And Don he's is one of the smartest dramaturgs I have ever met. Yes, was two of my shows. He gave me critique on at the very beginning, and that was so helpful. So yeah, he's wonderful. Um, Francis Matthews, uh, director and um, who and writer. He he also writes. Right. Yeah, um, Caroline Underwood, who uh, for years worked for Chapels, but now is an agent with Alan Brodie handling new musical writers. She is, and for many years, Caroline Underwood yeah. has been the person that I've called to have a moan at about the state of musical theatre. <laughs> Um, and of course, Mark Shenton, who uh, our revered critic, and yeah. um, who is a, an amazing person to have as part of the group really because he he really is the voice of the critics voice of musical theater and um, I'm such a staunch supporter of it and of the community yes yes I mean only a few weeks ago he had gone to see um, the the final year showcase of my 
a daughter's friends the year above her mm. and you know and just spent time writing critiques of all the main actors that you know he's just there and he, he's there on the way up and he's there for the people who are you know really well known so and I swear the man has more than 24 hours in a day because he just I know met. yeah so he's wonderful um, um, uh, George and Ants, of course yes yes of course, I told you I was never getting my mind. <laughs> um, they're fantastic, and and also very important to have well-known writers as part of the board who really understand and um, and give a real you know strong voice to the the writers. Yeah, we should say George George Styles and Anthony Drew to yeah. give them their full names. Yeah. Um, yeah, they are all magnificent people, and I know we've forgotten some. Um, well, there's but, the accountants and uh, uh, as well who are amazing, but I can't always remember. I can't remember all that. And also massive musical theatre fans. That's what I used to love so much about MMD board meetings is that everyone around the table would get suddenly distracted by talking about some musical that we all love. Yes, which is great. Yes, well, no, that's true. So um, it is extraordinary. We are extraordinarily lucky as a community. To, to have a, a table full of elders in that way. I think there's definite, and you as well, I think there's definite eldership in that room. Oh, no, um, there definitely is, yes. And that's just an extraordinary gift for all of us to have that. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, the wonderful administrators who do, let's face it, all the hard work. <laughs> Sarah, um, yes, who's wonderful and works for MTN and MMD. And she does. She does. She juggles two hats very well. And Martin as well, the lovely Martin. Martin Jackson. Um, is it Jackson? Yeah. Yes. Um, absolutely brilliant and um, so stalwart and work incredibly hard, really. And met, and that we recently had your annual conference, the MTN MMD conference, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that stuff that brings us together, I think, is really important. Um, where do you hope that MMD might be heading? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's difficult to say. I mean, I think that the Beam showcases were, are going to be a huge new development. Um, I just, I just hope that it continues to grow, really. Um, and re I think also the other thing is, I think that we've, I want the people who are have um, are so successful in musical theatre who are part of it. I want, I think it would be really nice if they took a greater part of it too, as well, because I think. We miss out on having the elders, as you say. So it yeah. would be really nice to see them more often, um, uh, so that the community felt like a larger community. Yeah. Although I think that um, I'm a firm believer in peer-to-peer -peer mentorship and peer-to-peer -peer eldering. I think anyone who has some experience that is broader than mine is an elder for me. And like, you know, anyone who knows an answer to a question that I don't know the answer to is an elder for me. And can I think we can all engage in in eldership. And also, you know, I have this thing about who else, um, which I'm desperately trying to persuade that the community the community there's a good idea. Which is anytime we get an opportunity as a writer, anytime I get an opportunity as a writer, I try and think who else can benefit from this. Mm -hmm. um, which means that when I last did a, a publishing deal, because I'm incredibly lucky that I got, a, I had a show published for children, and I said to my publisher, "This is great. Who else's work can we publish simultaneously?" <laughs> and my publisher just sort of stared at me. <laughs> um, but I do feel that making invitations to you know people to come into the room and join you in a process, or or just the sharing of knowledge, um, especially things like contracts, which I think we just we have no transparency, and you're right. You know, a lot of people don't have an agent and don't have that kind of advice uh, available to them. And I, th I wish that we could be more transparent about those things. I think as writers, it's very scary because so you you get so little opportunity to sign a contract with someone that it becomes a very sort of precarious situation where you don't want to mess it up or or you know or make the producer angry or whatever. I just think we're we're so careful around those things and actually we should be a little bit more open about those things for my money. So I but maybe that's a thing I will do through the larder is just try and pry those doors open a little bit more so that we have a little bit of more sharing, more sharing like this, like this kind of transparency and these kind of conversations are really important I think for us to have. I think. Um, I have one more note of a thing I'd like to talk to you about. Yes. And it says retreats on my bit of paper. Oh, yes. 
And I selfishly want to talk to you about that because I want to go on one. And you just went on one recently, didn't you? It was one of the best things. Um, the retreat I went on was called the it was called the Hosking Houses Trust retreat, um, set up by an amazing woman called Sarah Hosking, um, with an incredible board of people that work on it. Um, I don't quite know how I got it, but anyway, I did, and I've, I've done it twice now. Um, it, it not only includes an incredibly beautiful, tiny little cottage in Stratford-on-Avon in Clifford Chambers, uh, but it also is a bursary as well, so it's also money to live on, uh, wow. which is amazing. Um, it, it is, I've done the best solid amounts of writing I think I've ever done when I've been there because I haven't been able to go and see people. Um, I've been, the internet's not very good there, which is also... Well, that's that's good. always helpful. <laughs> um, and just being able to set up a very a strict regime, I think, but also to have the countryside, which I really loved. I read yeah. that. Um, so it was being able to sort of get up in the morning, write, have lunch, go for a walk, come back, work again. It it just was a perfect place to be and undisturbed by the rest of the world, really. How long were you there for? Um, both times for three months. And three months, it's quite hard to walk away from your life for three months. But it really is. Yeah, that's a long time. It's quite a long time. I did come up to town a few times. Um, to see things or to see people or have a few meetings, but I really tried not to do that. Um, and the first time that I went, I kept saying to people, oh, you must come and see me. And actually, once I got there, I realized that was the wrong thing to have said to people. <laughs> because it's, oh, you must go away again now. No, no, I don't actually want to see anyone. <laughs> people were very worried that I would be lonely, but in fact, strangely, I wasn't lonely. Um, the, the woman who runs the trust, Sarah Hosking, lives down Duck Lane, not very far from the cottage. So if you did get lonely at all, you could always go and see Sarah and knock on her door. Um, and I did go to the cinema with her a couple of times, and I did look after her chickens when she went away. <laughs> of course you did. Of course I did. <laughs> and took the dog for a walk for a few times. But even then I realised that taking the dog for a walk was a distraction, so that when I was walking I really only wanted to think about what I was thinking about. But um, I think for a lot of women it is quite hard, especially uh, to escape Is, it, is there a woman-only opportunity or, or no? For women over 40. It's just for women over 40? Yes, there is nothing else in the whole world that is only for women over 40. Except the menopause. Yes, <laughs> and the Hosking Houses Trust. <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing and it, <laughs> I, I feel those times I have absolutely cherished it's it's been they were amazing really and I you're allowed to take your animals so I took my cat uh, <laughs> it's just perfect <laughs> and other women have taken their dog and uh, you know that just sounds magnificent um where, give us a website. Is there a website for it? Um, yes. Oh, God. Just a minute. Let I'm just see. looking it up. What's it called? Hoskin? The Hosking, Hosking Housing yeah. Trust. That's what it's called. I'm looking it up. Here it is. Can you see it? The Google will tell us. Hoskinghouses.co.uk. That's H-O-S-K-I-N-G-H-O-U-S-E-S.co.uk. And... Um, Yes, you just have to. You have to write to Sarah. She'll tell you what she wants you to do. But I, I think what I actually did was I went to see her. I think that was how I got it the first time. I went to see a show at Stratford, and I went to see her on a hot day. I remember and got lost. But it was the fact that I went there to meet her, and we had fried egg on toast from the chickens. How uh, magnificent! Yeah, and. Uh, you know, from, I I really you know I count her as a friend, and um, she's an amazing woman. It actually has a lovely quote on the front of the website. And it, it's a Virginia Woolf uh, quote from A Room of One's Own, and it says, "A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction." <laughs> and and I feel that's still true. <laughs> yes, it is still true, and that's absolutely how she. That's her. And there's a little well, Virginia Woolf bag that has the same thing, <laughs> A Room of One's Own, and that was how she. That was the starting idea, was this idea that it was a room of your own. And it's a gift. 
It really is. I mean, that's yeah. absolutely magnificent. Yeah. Um, Teresa, I'm not going to keep you any longer, but thank you so much for unexpectedly joining me after some trouble with the Google Hangout for us after that. It was lovely to chat, and I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me. I will see you soon for a cup of tea. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so I'm going to hang up now, but take care. Yes, okay. Thank you. Bye.